There we go. Welcome everyone to today's uh, webinar, Transforming the ePortfolio Landscape, uh, ePortfolio Platform Providers Perspectives on AI. We are so excited that you are here. Just as a gentle reminder that today's session is being recorded. Uh, so you are welcome to change your name to a pseudonym or back channel any one of the presenters if you want to say something that you think might be spicy or otherwise questionably, uh, you know, uh, uh, inappropriate, but bring it our way. <laughs> And we're happy to field it for you. Uh, my name is Megan Mize. I am the moderator for today's session. And I am the co-chair of the Digital Ethics and ePortfolios Task Force, um, which is connected to ABLE. And we are so thrilled to have you here today for this really important uh, and obviously evolving conversation. And before we get into it, I just wanted to pause and thank the international ePortfolio community for supporting this ongoing series regarding the intersection of AI and ePortfolio concerns. So as you can see here, we have folks representing ABLE, ePortfolios Australia, and ePortfolio Ireland. Um, and we are so glad because this has been an ongoing series for <clears throat> the last year, and it will no doubt continue into the future. And... So for today's session, uh, we're going to do some quick overview or introductions, and then we're just going to ask our panelists a series of questions about things like the benefits and drawbacks of AI and ePortfolio platforms, thinking about user experience, how it impacts student engagement, what sorts of ethical considerations might we have, inclusivity promotion, and future development of these kinds of platforms and tools, and then have a Q and A. Um, and one thing I want to stress is that this is a conversation, so please do, in the chat as we go, put questions in. Um, I will try to have the back channel up, uh, but again, my screen is the one being shared, so I don't want to distract you unduly. Um, for, the for, for time, we will probably put questions um, on the back burner till the end, just to make sure that we can get through all of these and then have a larger group conversation. But please put them in as you think about it. Chat amongst yourselves, um, because this is obviously a really important topic for our community. And with that being said, I would actually like to turn it over to our panelists, who you can see here in their bright, shiny faces and also on their video screens. And if we could just go in order, have each of you introduce yourself, talk a little bit about your role and how your interests connect with today's topic. Yada. My name is Christina Hoppner and I'm the project lead of the Bahada Open Source Project. And I'm located in early morning Tefanganui Atara, Wellington in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And I've been in my role since um, about 2014, but have been working with the Mahara development team since 2010 uh, when I moved to New Zealand. And before then, I had been using it actually at a university as nice. a lecturer and also trainer. And my interest today is also as part of the ABLE Digital Ethics Task Force. I'm one of the co-chairs with Megan and also Morgan Gresham uh, from South Florida State University in St. Petersburg. And um, yeah, we'd just like to have a conversation with all of you and progress the topic of AI and portfolios thinking about it. And also for me to learn from everybody else and learn what is being done in this space so that we can also advise our clients and community members better. Thank you. Over to you, Ellery. Thank you. Um, my name is Ellery Rojas and I'm with Wix. I'm an academic partnerships manager. I want to say the last almost two and a half, three years, uh, but I came from higher ed. So I worked the last 10 years in higher education and I work directly with students, with universities, with any stakeholders, any staff, faculty that are interested in building portfolios and using Wix as that platform uh, and also being able to even touch on the, I, want to, I don't want to say it's new AI. I think last summer it just exploded. Uh, so happy to touch more on uh, how AI is kind of changing the game a little bit. Thank you for having me. So I guess it's me. Um, I'm Shane. I'm, I'm surprised how many people in this in the attendance so far know me because uh, I had this whole thing about my backstory and stuff. But basically it goes a bit like this. Uh, I'm an accidental businessman and software developer still an academic at heart um like jeff i'm a kind of founder and ceo but pretty rubbish at it to be honest 
my happy place is talking to educators about how to use portfolios to enhance learning and teaching and career and future readiness. So yeah, that's me. All right, then it's me. Um, I guess, um, Shane, I think you, your words were, um, like Jeff, I'm pretty rubbish at, at being a CEO of the and a founder. Sorry, Jeff, that was not my intention. <laughs> I look up to Jeff. And, and... No, I, I, I thought it was pretty, so I, I think it's a great way to get that feedback from, 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 from you as well, <laughs> Shane. Ditto. Um, all jokes aside, Shane and I have known each other for a long time. I am one of the co-founders and CEO of Digication. I started um, when I was a faculty member at Rhode Island School of Design, um, uh, and uh, that was in the fall of 2000. So it's coming to about 24 years, um, and um, you know, I I still think and breathe uh, portfolio um, every day and. AI is obviously one of the one of the hot topics and one of the things that we think a lot about, and it's a lot of a lot that we are working on as well. So, um, lo really looking forward to learning from this panel and from everyone else. Thank you, guys. Um, so let's get right into it. Uh, so first, let me move my chat so I can actually see our question. There we go. So the first question is. What are the potential benefits and drawbacks of incorporating AI-driven features into portfolio practice? And it looks like Christina and Shane volunteered to take the first shot at this. Okay, since you mentioned my name first, I think I'll, I'll, I'll make a start on it. Um, yeah, benefits and drawbacks are really good because for, for me, they are definitely always two sides to using artificial intelligence as, as a tool. And so just a couple of the benefits I see are, especially in accessibility. I mean, we are seeing it here also in, in our session. Somebody did turn on the captions, making it easier to, to follow the session along. Um, there's also the possibility of actually having the session translated automatically in another language, which makes it more accessible to other people. Um, and not all of us are native speakers, so somebody might actually really benefit from having that done automatically rather than needing to wait until the session is finished. They take the recording and put it through a system or have somebody help them translate it. Um, the second point where I see a benefit is also in supporting learners in their reflection. Um, happy to come back to that at a later stage, uh, but recently I've been exploring Riff, which is a reflection bot by Letizia Pretas Cavagnaro at Stanford University in the D School. Um, and also other people have been starting to look into, well, how can we support learners with their reflection, um, help them get to the reflection, help them make reflection better. There's also a project in Germany. And um, a third benefit that I see is supporting assessment practices. I mean, we know that uh, lots of educators are time poor, especially also when they have very large classes, but they do still want to do well by their students and give them feedback. And so AI can be one of those tools. Before coming to my drawbacks, I think I'd like to hand it over to Shane so that we can just talk a little bit longer about more benefits that you you see there. Oh, thanks for dropping me in it, uh, Christina. So I, I want to say everything Christina just said. I also want to say that if I went back to my introduction, I wanted to say that AI is not my comfort area. And especially with Kevin in the audience as well, because I've heard him speak. And uh, so I'm, I'm speaking to people who are probably much more expert than me. Um, but I think I've got pretty good learning and teaching instincts. And I think I'll fall back on those as we have this conversation. Um, I mean, like you, Christine, I've been playing with Riff and I think it's very powerful. Um, and I think AI, particularly in specific uh, products, particularly like things like simulation software, can do really powerful debriefing um, and in fact preparing students for those experiences. But when I was thinking about this question, I didn't think just about AI. I was thinking specifically around about gen AI. Um, and I, I think, um, well, 
maybe when people listen to this recording, a lot of people may not know about PebblePad, but only about 7% of things in PebblePad are portfolios. The vast majority of things are actually reflections or or preflections, as my colleague Gail, who's here, likes to think about them in the planning and preparing for learning. And that happens through sort of structured and scaffolded templates, templates which have been thoughtfully put together by educators. And so, again, thinking about the question itself, a, a, a phrase that sprang to my mind almost immediately was um, from an old colleague of mine, Judy Hughes, an early portfolio pioneer. And she said that um, using um, our platform, I'll try not to say PebblePad too often because it starts to sound like a pitch. And I, and Jeff, keep a tally so you can say digication as many times as I say PebblePad. But she said it gave students a, a safe space to think about and make sense of their learning. And I think there's something that worries me still about AI, about taking away the sense of it being a safe space. Um, you've, we've seen so many you know, examples recently, haven't we, where AI, because of the prompts that are sort of engineered into it, um, you know, creates these, uh, this misinformation, disinformation, hallucinations, and general just meltdowns, actually. In fact, uh, I, I made a note of a quote that uh, a great writer, I'll put the link in um, into the chat later on, um, talking about what had happened at Gemini and ChatGPT and the engineered in quote said, uh, both events show that the behavior of models can be transformed by the tweak of a parameter over at Google stroke OpenAI headquarters. This is the best bit. Let's hope the people in charge of all this continue to be regular, well-adjusted, public-spirited citizens. And uh, you know, I think there's some big question marks about the people who are offering up these large language models and what their um, uh, incentives are. Um, but I was thinking also about that safe space thing and um, about um, one of our recent conferences. We had a paramedic um, who had been a student using the platform to record and reflect and make sense of their skills as they developed. Um, and he's now actually a, a lecturer, but he also is still a practicing paramedic to keep his uh, license valid. And he said uh, he uses the platform every day, or rather after every shift, um, to record the things that he's witnessed that day. And he said, it helps to protect me from PTSD. It gets the experiences out of my head and into this personal learning space. And I think there's something that troubles me about AI, which is we're sort of contracting out some of the prompts and the, the responses into large data models that, that even if they are safe and bounded, there's something about the perception of space, something about the perception of the privacy, confidentiality, and personal nature of portfolio spaces where people do feel able to think through their fingertips to get things out of their system to look back at them over time, to share them under their control with a trusted circle of peers and colleagues, get feedback and get empowered to share them even more widely. So um, I, I, that's, I suppose, I mean, I could keep on talking, but I would just keep on giving more examples of the same kind of theme there. So, um, and yet, like you, uh, Christina, I, I've played around with Riff and it's it's fabulous. Um, but I, for me and for my customers, and there's actually a couple on, on here today, we've had conversations and we think there's something at the moment around being um, proudly steam powered until the field matures a bit more, until we get more confidence about the technology before um, we utilize it in our platform because of the risk of harm, the potential risk of harm to that paramedic, to the nursing students who were reflecting on the first death they experienced on the ward, to the anxious engineering student coming up to their first exam or the first year student you know, being away from home for the first time. So I'm relying on you now to, to pick up the pieces from that, Christina, and uh, from, from that kind of almost 
doom laden view and it's not doom laden because i think there are very specific examples where ai can be really powerful in learning teaching and assessment i worry about contracting out reflection or reflective prompts to it right now because you're dealing with very sensitive in my experience very sensitive thoughts that get put into the system and i completely agree with you there shane um and like you i'm torn between advocating for trying things out versus also seeing the the big dangers and the uh that's where you're getting to the drawbacks which for me are very much in the privacy and security area um because does every student know for example that when they put something into chat gpt through the web interface that it is the yeah, that it can be used by the company where does confidentiality and where do we keep student content safe, especially when you're sharing very personal moments, very difficult moments, um, or yeah, work with vulnerable communities. And then also kind of going to an earlier point that you made um, with your comment, it is all around bias as well. Somebody put the training data in, somebody categorized it, but does that actually mean that that same data set that was developed with a US centric um, context in mind also works in the New Zealand context, also works even just in the Canadian context, works in the German context, French, Europe, and in any other co country's context, does it work there? Because of course, cultural norms, um, ideas, and also reference points are very different. Um, but now suddenly everything comes kind of to this one data set or a few data sets and that is suddenly being taken as the basis and so that is where I think we do need to be careful and not just rush in and implement things and say here's production ready new features in certain areas especially when it comes to gener um, generative AI but really be careful and work with our communities in order to tease all of these things out. Megan, yes, I think that's a that's you, a leading yeah, point to the next question. You can also tell that I am a type A, uh, and I did put in the chat, but I think this is really interesting because I'm hearing kind of a couple of themes coming through here. But the this idea that a lot of times students might perceive the ePortfolio as a private space for reflection or with a kind of closed audience, but then in higher ed we also have this push for that to be assessment data so they don't know who within the institution is looking at their materials or push to even have them be kind of public facing content. And then AI sitting right there doing the same sorts of things to their data. Um, but now we now we care about it in different ways. So, um, you know, I, I too have students in cybersecurity who, who laugh at this idea that AI is private and yet people will tell it all sorts of things. Um, so with that being said, let's move on to the next question about AI and portfolios. Thank you both. Uh, how do you envision AI enhancing the functionality and user experience of your ePortfolio platform? And I believe Jeff and Ellery agreed to tackle this one. Sure. Um, I, Ellery, would you like to go first? I'm happy sure. to go. I'll, I'll chat yeah. it up. Not a okay, problem. Go, go, you don't go have ahead. to tell me twice, Jeff. <laughs> um, I would like to say that um, the function of AI definitely has enhanced everything on the platform. It's something that we've been kind of playing around with artificial design intelligence since 2016. So being that it's the talk of uh, the, the top topic right now in conferences, in higher education, uh, I mean, career coaches and faculty, they're all scrambling and excited and worried at the same time. I hear tons of fears, um, but also excitement. And I think the function of AI is something that's helping in a lot of instances. I work with a lot of students, as many as you, who are really battling that wave of how do I even get started with something? And so I feel like AI is helping. It helps with, you know, text creation. It helps with template creation. It helps with um, alternating the layouts of how you're going to put things on your portfolio when you're building a site and putting everything together. 
It helps with creating images. It helps with generating descriptions. If you're having trouble with, uh, I have this project and, and I know someone in the career office told me about the STAR method, but how do I put this all together? And being able to jumpstart that um, and even take shortcuts in a way, um, I think are really helping students understand that um, they can get started with something. And then I think it takes a, uh, I had the struggle with it this past week in the conference where they're like, okay, they jumpstart it, but where does it become like plagiarism, right? Like uh, what, when does it start uh, becoming a problem when they just copy and paste? And those things are the questions that we get from faculty at the end of the day where it's like, okay, well, if it's for a class assignment, and they're just fooling around with it and starting to build this portfolio uh, where they're learning that process. And then when they get to the end of the year and they have this portfolio that they have to show to an employer of their work and the things that they've done, uh, I, that, I feel like that's when they really see the difference um, of that functionality being a jump start. And then, hey, this is a real world thing and I need to use this. Uh, and I think we were played around in the beginning of the session talking about, you could tell when it's an AI giving you information and words and language, uh, as opposed to a person kind of giving you that. So um, I think it it's a great place to jumpstart. It, it takes away code completely, you know, at least for our platform. You don't have to worry about any of that backend stuff. You just plug in information and it helps you get started on that process. Uh, and for us, it's something that's um, really enhanced our website creation, right? So you can get started on thinking of an idea of what you want to do for your portfolio um, and then plug in different colors, like plug in anything that you want and it builds it for you and it comes up with something that's very unique to that user. So I feel like the experience of AI is something that is helping a lot of people, especially my students that uh, can't seem to jump start it. It gives them that opportunity to start that process. Um, when they're kind of building something. Jeff. Thanks. Um, uh, Ed, you know, what we've been thinking a lot about, um, I think um, Shane and I share a lot of um, um, philosophical similarities in our approach to, to this whole endeavor. You know, Shane said it's seven percent of his work is in portfolio, the rest in reflection. I would say that that's kind of maybe I don't know the percentage we have encountered on our end, but we think in very similar terms. We think that, you know, the idea of giving the students time and space to reflect and to make connections of their various learning experiences in and outside of the classroom is is what makes um what's most, what's really important in today's sort of education reform. Um, and, and for, for us, uh, we have um, made some, uh, what we feel like uh, good progress on um, essentially providing um, AI powered reflective tools for our students. We actually had just showed it um, for the first time publicly last Saturday at the AAC and U conference. Um, and, in some ways, it's not that different. At least the you know the public facing part that different from something like uh, Riff, which I know people, everyone, a lot of people here knows about already, and it's been shared in the chat. Um, and um, the this this idea that um, we can help students think deeper and dig deeper at their experiences has been quite interesting. Um, especially, I would say that, um, you know, a few things that we've learned is that um, it's very common when our students doing reflections is that they do, their reflection is sort of, maybe we'll call it one layer deep, because they would do it one time. Um, and it could be, they could be doing it on a weekly basis, but they're doing it one time, which means that they talk about the experience one time and whatever that came to mind, that's the, 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 the sort of reflection. Um, and what I find um, so far has been using, you know, 
sort of um, AI assisted reflection has been that um, it just kind of prompt the students to continue to dig deeper, even if they thought they were done. Um, and so it's the iterations, number of iteration that happens in the student's head. This really has nothing to do with the AI at all. I actually joke about it with my friends that said, hey, so this is basically like the five why process. If people don't know about it, look that up. It's pretty interesting. And I said, it's basically yes. If you ask someone the same question, uh, ask a question and then ask them why five times, they just naturally get deeper and they get to a point where, you know, they, they've exhausted more of that experience and they really sort of understood it. And so in many ways, um, that's what we are seeing right now is that, you know, the, the, the depth of the reflection gets, um, gets uh, deeper and it seems, seems, to be, seems to be really uh, encouraging from, from what we've seen so far. So that's, that's, that's really the, the big thing that we are working on and focusing on and we think that's where we can in, make the b biggest impact so far on our platform. Thank you, Jeff, and congratulations on uh, putting that out there publicly. Um, just Doesn't to... mean it's good. It's just uh, publicly. <laughs> sure, sure, of course. Um, I support that uh, dif distinction. I was thinking, too, uh, recently in our quality enhancement planning faculty development workshop series, a lot of times we think about younger users, but one of my colleagues who is maybe closer to retirement than, than our students, um, has severe arthritis in both hands and was working with Wix, ha has the generative AI, and he was able to type in a few words and get paragraphs that he could then edit. And he was just so excited at that as an accessibility feature for him. And so um, in terms of functionality, I think about that when would people like express that anxiety? I also think about how different that was for him to have ownership of something, um, you know, that that was still something he wrote and edited, but you know, not not as physically painful for him to to get through. Thank you both for that. So let's move on to our next question. In what ways do you anticipate AI impacting students' engagement and effectiveness in utilizing ePortfolios for their learning? journey. And I think for student engagement, we have Shane and Jeff, though, of course, you guys are welcome to jump in on any of these. Well, should I jump in and give Jeff just a rest a minute? Um, I think, um, I mean, it is fascinating, Jeff, how we're relying, because I think, you know, from our educational backgrounds and uh, the, the process side of things has always been so important to us. Um, and five whys is a great kind of technique isn't it and it but it reminded me when you're talking about it and i'm gonna i'm going to misrepresent this i'm sure but maybe tracy or helen can kind of put me right but um kathy yancey used to talk about a technique she used where she'd say if i if i gave you this imagine you gave me a piece of work let me say how it worked. imagine you gave me a piece of work what feedback do you think i would give you on that don't don't tell me and when i gave you that feedback what feedback would you give me about your feedback and don't tell me that now tell me or write about what you think I would say about your feedback on my feedback on your work and I just thought it was just absolutely wonderful they kind of because the students had to adopt two different kind of positions didn't they and try and you know we almost have a kind of dialogue with themselves based on on their work and so some really powerful techniques and I think um you know, when, when I look at um, some of the work that, that we see in our platform, it's the result of really thoughtful educators posing really thoughtful questions and using actually thoughtful language. So I'm, I've just come from Waterloo and there there's an example where they ask students to talk about their inspired insights and magnificent failures and all these kind of prompts that take them on a journey to uncover, you know, the experiences they've had to help develop the habit of noticing to make things explicit and, and, and surface those and I think it's uh, it's in the surfacing that I think uh, we'll start to see the biggest impact of AI but maybe not for the reasons you might start to think about. I, I, I want you just to say about some research also from um, I think it was Deakin University uh, who did some research into student reflections and the students responded they said um, they're talking about you know writing reflections for assessment and um, they like it when we make them cry 
and they'd sort of learnt these techniques because what got them the best kind of remark, uh, you know, best marks was was that real emotional stuff. But they used to fabricate it, and so what we think is a really uh, authentic, you know, we 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 position reflection as just this wonderful thing. But actually, unless it's properly situated, properly scaffolded, connected back to practice, it can also be pretty inauthentic. Um, so where am I going with all this? I think, I think um, where we will see the most impact on portfolio practice from AI will be from other forms of assessment, where people are really worried that they can't differentiate between things which are which originate from the student's own kind of thinking and learning and things which have been uh, contracted out to to a generative AI engine. And part of the reason for that is because we have often awful assessment processes. We ask students to go and do a piece of work. They do it in a black box. They hand something in at the end. We've not seen any of it at all. And then we make assumptions or I'd like to suggest guesses about, you know, where that work originated and we and then we contract that out to things like turn it in and all those other things in the past and actually what we ought to be doing is helping students uh plan and prepare more effectively helping them level questions at the work they're doing to be more engaged with it to to keep records of that work and then to reflect on what they learned and how they connect it to skills and I think that applies to all sorts of experiences from placements and projects and undergraduate research, group projects, peer and self-assessment, even writing an essay has a kind of temporal element. And we can scaffold that and we can help guide students through it so they're more likely to be successful. And we can make that visible to them and also to us as educators and, and assessors. So I, I think um, what we'll see is an awful lot more portfolio practice where people are writing portfolios but not about them you know about me portfolios but about things i've done a lab experiment a writing assignment a piece of research any kind of project and making that visible and showing all of the working out if you will and i think these little portfolios themselves produce fabulous evidence to work towards the bigger portfolios that help me demonstrate my unique abilities and, and qualities. So ironically, the failure of other platforms and other assessment processes will, I think, lead to greater, more interesting and in portfolio practice as we, I suppose, right to the rescue of more traditional forms of assessment. Um, Shane, I think that those are, I agree. Um, probably to me, going back to, by the way, am I supposed to speak next, <laughs> Megan? I think I am. <laughs> yes, that's right. Um, Shane had given, uh, had, had let you, me rest. You got your vacation. You're yes, back on the right. clock. That's right. That's right. Um, I, I, I'm constantly going back to the, that reflection part of the, the process, um, I think that Megan, actually, you had already said in the chat that this just in time, um, low social profile, um, or low social risk feedback seems to be, you know, it it's it's pretty interesting, and I have seen that. I I just did this um little reflection exercise using uh, our AI um um tool with a uh, high school student. Um, she's a senior and. And she said, you know, she, she, I invited her to try it out. And, and she said, well, do you want me to do something like really consequential, like something big or just anything? And I already knew what she was talking about. She was like, do you want me to basically come with something that is going to contain the meaning of life? You know, I'm 18 years old, but I know already, I read figure stuff out. And do you want me to talk, talk, talk about that? Or do you want me to just talk about stuff that doesn't, you know, is not as, as heavy? And I said, no, 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 talk about whatever that you feel comfortable. It doesn't have to be big. Actually, something small is fine. Something that happened just last week would be great. And and she said, oh, okay. So she put into the chat that, hey, look, um, last week I was just walking, 
you know, with my friends somewhere, we were usually really, you know, busy walking from place to place and we got to go to, to class. Uh, but we actually had a little break. And so we stopped and just enjoyed ourselves in a park. And we hadn't done this for a while, but we were, you know, just hanging out, enjoying the sunshine. And, and, and then, you know, the, the, like literally it's, it's, it's a small thing. It didn't, nothing really substantial happened. You know, it, it, it's probably not even something that she would otherwise think twice about. Uh, but then the chat said, well, well, that's, that's great. What, what the, how does, how does that make you feel when you had taken some time to do something that was, you know, that allows you to relax and enjoy, you know, the company of your friends. And then so she started having this conversation and dialogue that drives her to think a lot more about, you know, the importance of being able to um, not always be, you know, sort of so task and goal oriented and that made her, you know, reveal something of herself. I think that these are the types of things that they are subtle, small things. But when you add these subtle, small things, you know, many, many more times than once a semester or once a week into into your into your habits, I think that it goes to that. Um, I think Helen, you know, your habit of mind for you know in folio thinking. I think that this this ability for that to happen could be so engaging and so awesome you know to develop the, these these ways of thinking um i i i think that that's a um that's a a, a pretty big area that we we feel we feel really good about in terms of getting um getting student engagement um into you know going through this portfolio process and perhaps, if anything, um, uh, this will probably echo with Shane's, you know, ideas as well, which is maybe the journey, the process will become much more the part of what we think about when we think about portfolio as opposed to the final website, the final results, the final, you know, showcase portfolio. Um, it may just, you know, there might be a lot more interest in the in the in the in the making of the portfolios, um, I think that that was that was everything for me. I see Christina is unmuted, but I just want to say Jeff is someone who comes from kind of a writing writing studies background. I really appreciate that reframe and turn back to iterative design and process driven design because I think that's something that really gets lost in e-portfolio conversations with colleagues who are not the people who eat live, breathe portfolios, they they produce that final product. And I think in an era of AI, it can it can take us back to the meat and potatoes of portfolio practice where we're really focusing on how do we get here? What evolving habitudes are we trying to foster? And I won't say much more. I have stuff, but I saw Christina unmute herself and she is a panelist. I just wanted to vociferously agree with that last thought. I don't know, you, you can go on, Megan. Um, I just, just what Jeff had said about the, the reflection and that the student thought about it and uh, had some more questions asked. Um, in the chat, Patsy had mentioned that one of her colleagues had used AI to generate poetic feedback and that students were really touched by that. And that I think is for, for me really a very good example of how we can enhance the, the student learning there. That the feedback is not just some generic feedback, but AI, especially when you're in those larger classes where you're wondering, well, how can I get through? Um, giving, giving meaningful feedback to 250 students within just two days or so, that the AI can support that and can be a starting point for it. I'm not saying that this should be the, the be all and end all and instructors should still look over those comments and still see um, is that appropriate or does anything else need to be changed? But it could be a good starting point because um, what I've seen the reflection board do is that it is mirroring back to you, that it's not just saying, oh, thanks for your feedback. So what do you want to do next? But really rephrasing things and um, therefore also making you think a bit more, huh? 
that wasn't really what I had thought um, I would take away from this experience. Or when you look at a summary that an AI gives you at the end of a text, oh, that's actually a good point that was in there. So it can lead to further reflection, further thinking, because um, oftentimes what we, we also feel, see is that or uh, no is also that learning just doesn't happen in a bubble all by ourselves, but that through the engagement with others, through sharing what we are thinking, having conversations, that's actually where we can then also change our opinions, um, learn from them and uh, get to a different space. And that's, I think, where uh, generative AI through reflection bots, through other experience can be beneficial. Um, but of course, also I feel still with supervision because I would not want to let that loose on anyone with, without kind of having an eye over it. I agreed. And I wanted to share a quick anecdote about this in that I have my students run pages in their portfolio through a checker for you know, web accessibility, et cetera, and um, also color contrast, other things like that. And one class in particular, I had a group of students who were like, I'm not a designer, I, I don't care, was kind of their initial uh, response. And then when they got feedback from the AI, uh, they suddenly became the world's greatest rhetoricians, who every decision had absolutely been uh, vetted and supported and rationalized. And I was like, you, you don't have to convince me or the machine, but they were writing me paragraphs. And so when I take this question of student engagement, they were absolutely engaged in identity performance and the ways in which they were choosing to do that by a design, but before they had not explicitly said that until they were prompted to by the bot they were working with. So, all right, we, we said a lot about that one. Let's, let's turn our attention uh, as you have uh, at least two co-chairs of Digital Ethics Task Force here and, and other members uh, represented. Uh, what ethical considerations guide your decisions regarding AI implementation in your platform? Um, I know Christina and um, Shane, you volunteered to take on this incredibly light, not at all complex or difficult or frightening for some question. Shane, do you want to make a start this time? No. But, uh, but I really okay. would like me to. <laughs> <laughs> no, no worries. I'm I'm ready to go. I've got my link. Just paste it into the chat because, of course, um, for, for me, and, and that's also a reason why I'm, why I'm on the task force. It is to learn from everybody and also to have those, have the possibility to have those conversations. And I'm very grateful that I've had the chance to be on the Able Digital Ethics Task Force since it started in 2019 and been working with Megan, with Jeff, with Kevin, and many others, all the ones that are not on today's call, um, over the years in order to tease out, well, what digital ethics principles do we want to have considered when we are talking about portfolio practice? And of course, um, not everybody needs to tick off 10 boxes because it is not really a checkbox exercise. But um, I do always come back to these 10 principles that we have developed over the years because they do encompass a lot of the things that I feel we also need to take into consideration when looking at incorporating AI and not just generative AI, but lots of other things um, into our practice. Because in our last session, and while I'm talking, Megan might be able to find the, the video link to that for the, for the February session. Um, in February, in our last AI webinar, we talked about six emerging trends where AI could be used. And so just as a brief recap, that would be text improvement, accessibility, color design, and layout support, media editing, and content generation. So, of course, all of that makes sense. And a lot of those things for me boil down really to accessibility, um, that it's easier for people to do things, um, also re referencing the example that Megan brought on earlier. And also, as I already touched on as well, especially privacy and security, and not to forget the, the principle that Kevin and I worked on primarily, which is DEIBD, diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, and decolonization, which of course in the AI field is hotly discussed and hotly debated and where we see a lot of things really just not being awesome, um, simply because, yeah, there's a lot 
lot of bias in the data. Um, there is not a fair representation of everybody who is and is not on the call today in those data sets in how things are being interpreted because artificial intelligence is just not intelligent. Um, it is a predict uh, generative AI is predictive. Um, Alex Hanna from, and I always like to quote him because it just makes so much sense to me in a lot of ways. Um, Alex Hanna from the um, DEAR Institute, Distributed AI Research Institute, um, in, in one of the first Mystery AI Hype Theater episodes that he and Emily and Bender had done, he said he kind of likes to equate AI with mathy math. And that really stuck with me and is for me always a good reminder that it is just math. It is just predicting. It is predicting the next word based on what is in the corpus, what has been collected in the past and what people have said. But of course, there's a huge bias in there. And yes, we can look at a lot of the examples and answers and say, oh, yeah, this, this sounds really good and this works. But that is also our lived experience. What happens if somebody else puts that in? So that's why for me, always coming back to these things and kind of really find, finding the balance. Well, there is accessibility, but then what about privacy and security? How can we make sure that we find a happy medium that we are also happy with in promoting to our students, um, to our lecturers and saying, hey, this is a safe space for you to use and not just, hey, this is an easy space for you to use. And um, I did put into the chat the, the link to the ISOP project, one of the German AI and portfolio projects that are specifically looking at feedback and also assessment strategies and supporting uh, supporting organizations with assessment. They are doing it primarily text-based at the moment um, at the University in Bremen, coincidentally also in Germany. There's a project that look at it in a multimodal context even and looking at not just text, but also videos and images and the like. And so these projects being based in Germany, they have immensely difficult and very strict and stringent privacy matters to look into. They can't just use a, a corpus that is out there and plug it or plug into ChatGPT or Gemini or any of the other things. They need to have things either locally or have uh, developed their own data set just to ensure that um, the, the student data is kept private, that nothing is leaked out. And then of course, on top of that, it's also all in German, not in English. So there's another layer. So there's lots and lots of layers in there that do need to be considered. And as Shane mentioned earlier already, it needs to be considered carefully and not just jumped in, um, jumped onto the latest thread. On, on the other hand, though, I think um, we do need to experiment, but we do need to experiment with those digital ethics in mind and not just say, let's experiment for the sake of experimentation and just go wild west and just use anything and then we backtrack because backtracking is much more difficult. Once kind of the cat is out of the bag in a lot of ways, I think it is much more difficult than to put in um, any necessary boundaries Christina. because they hadn't been considered from the start. And that's all I want I'm to so say. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry to cut you guys off. Um, we have 10 minutes left and two more questions to go. So we're going to go into our lightning round. Shane, did you, did you have any like a 60 second thing you wanted to say on ethics before we click over? I think Christina touched on so much. And I think that thing about backtracking is really difficult, you know, hence being very cautious here, um, but without being a Luddite actually. But I mean, someone posted a question the other day on LinkedIn and it said, you know, to those things you talked about, about uh, colon uh, decolonizing or the colonial nature actually of much of the data it's in, the misrepresentation of data that's in there, outsourcing to the global South. Uh, and the question was, um, if you um, proposed building a Gen I, Gen AI system and took it to your university ethics committee and told them about all the ways you're going to operate it, um, would they actually approve it? And, and the chances are probably not because there are so many ethical issues around AI. So a lot of conversations I've had with people recently have been around um, making sure it's utilized in the most effective ways because of the amount of power it, it takes, the the implications on water and all of those are the moral and ethical decisions. 
Um, and yet, if I was an educator, I think I would definitely be, if I was still an educator, I would be playing around with this. I would having, be having my students do things, but I would be very aware of the context in which that was happening. Um, very aware of the, of the likelihood of harm. Sorry, that wasn't 60 seconds. You're like. fine. I apologize. You can tell my uh, Catholic upbringing and guilt is coming into play uh, when I feel bad. But I do want to switch to this next one because I actually think you all have hinted at this or topped on it. And Ellery, I'd really like to hear from you on this one. I know you signed up for it. But how do you ensure that AI-driven features promote inclusivity and diversity in portfolio creation and assessment? I think much of what Christina mentioned and Shane touched a little bit on it. Um, it's one of those things where whatever you add into the algorithms at the end of the day is what could help uh, a lot of those inclusivity and diversity issues. Um, I think diversity and inclusivity looks different for different people. And you mentioned that a little bit. Um, it depends on what part of the world you're in. And I also think it's going to be tough. It's going to be something that's going to be hard to regulate, hard to manage. And it's going to be one of those things where it's uh, a learning curve constantly. Um, so I don't think there's going to be a true answer for this. Um, and I love what Christina was talking about, just digesting that with all the different countries and what that looks like. Um, and Megan, you're mentioning whitewashing of images. It's it's plenty of things, right? Um, I think that's why in um, one of the tools that we have for AI images, you're able to, to create something based on what that looks like for you. And so it just comes up with an image and it doesn't necessarily choose a specific uh, gender or a specific color or things like that. It's just whatever you end up picking and choosing. Uh, but I think it's going to be difficult uh, to add diversity in an algorithm. Uh, I think that's something that you're never going to end up getting 100% right in AI. Christina, I know you wanted to touch on this. Yes. Um, no, I think I've said all already um, for, for that part. So I'd rather give some space to another question. Actually, I, I want to add something to it real quick. Um, this is maybe not so much. I mean, I, I agree. It's just so hard. It's very difficult. The, the base model, which are really currently owned by around half a dozen ish LL, big LLM companies, the current LLM, LLM models is already costing maybe north of $2 billion to build. And in the next few years, there's going to be $10 billion you know, to build the base layer, um, which are, you know, people like Google and Meta and OpenAI are going to have the ability to build. Short of that, maybe a few government bodies and that's it. Um, so, and and that's the, that's the base where it comes from. But I do think that there's going to be a proliferation of the middle tier um, um, part of this industry that hasn't really appeared yet. I actually would really like to see higher education be part of that. And so while, you know, if you imagine that the basic LLM is providing, you know, the ability for to shape, you know, the basic ability to do languages and, you know, translations, all the things that we've now come to know what it can do, um, but to then think of um, higher education or education in general, being able to then contribute in private ways, not going back to the LLM, LLM themselves, unless it makes sense to do so, uh, but to be able to create a second layer that can say, hold on a minute, in addition to that, we can also teach it and shape it to this other, you know, help it turn it into an, this other being. Um, I, I I really think that that's possible. And I really think that the, the, actually the a huge part of it is going to be based on, you know, in education institutions, we actually do hold the keys to a huge amount of trusted, verified, you know, peer reviewed, if you will, even in some cases, data um, that are all in pursuit of truth and, 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 and not looking at it with, you know, with um, um, 
perhaps less of the cultural biases and 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 colored lenses um, that had gone into what goes into the current you know AI model. So um, I I just want to say that as a let's hope that that might be something that can help. I think that's a very good point, especially given you know recent. Uh occurrences in our social media landscape in which the public sphere changed pretty drastically when the few owned the platform of the many. And we can see that with LLMs as the next kind of digital monopoly, I would think. And that's um, definitely concerning. So I appreciate you talking about that. Um, our final question here uh, with four minutes, and I'm going to open it to everyone, even though some of you signed up for it. How do you plan to continue to evolve and refine the AI capabilities of your platform to meet the changing needs of educators and learners? Um, I can start with that and, and really just continue with the way that Jeff ended. It is working with the organizations that, that are using our platforms, in particular also with higher education, um, have those partnerships where, because they can oftentimes tap into research grants and projects to look into these areas. They are also the owners and holders of the data. Um, and for us, it is very important that they know that it's their data. Um, it doesn't need to come to us as platform provider. So it is really having those conversations with him, um, having workshops with him. I posted about one in the chat that is coming up and uh, also having yeah really conversations, being part of those research projects in order to get further along. Besides, of course, also trialing and experimenting on our own within the development team. So it is really um, both together. Um, I want to maybe contribute one thing to it. Um, th there's so many things, obviously, uh, but we, we didn't really get to talk about the affordability of AI. Um, and and I think that it certainly goes back into some of the ethical and you know other concerns as well. Um, it it AI is actually really not cheap today um, to run the kind of things that you know even OpenAI does right in ChatGPT these conversations are actually quite expensive to run um, for all of the all of the opportunities that we see that students can do X, Y, and Z, generate things, generate content, generate reflections, you know, help guide X, Y, and Z. These are actually not cheap things to do. Um, I don't even think this, you know, institutions have been, seen, been provided with any kind of uh, financial data on, hey, if you're gonna do this 365 days a year, this is how much it's going to cost and 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 even if it is good can you afford to actually do this um i think that there's quite a lot that still needs needs to happen there um and if institutions can't figure that out at scale then students are really completely screwed um and so so we have quite a lot of work there to try to figure out a financially sustainable model but also not being so scared that we completely, you know, shy away from it because some of this thing will come back cheaper. Um, and so there's a lot of variables at hand. You know, you can do things more expensively if you were to use the latest model, the smartest ones. But if you were to be willing to use something that is slightly less smart, um, but uh, can do the job, sometimes it could be a fraction of the cost. And so there's all of these different things now that people are really trying to figure out. You know, essentially you don't need to bring, um, you know, something super fancy for something that could be done really simply. Um, and, and, and these are, are going to become, um, I feel like a huge part that we have to figure out as, as institutions, as an industry, as people that provide the tools, you know, as vendors um, and how, how to support it. Well, thank you, both of you. Oh, I see Shane's hand up. Uh, just really quickly, I know some people are leaving. We're going to stay for a few more minutes if the panelists are okay with that and wrap this out. We just have really one or two more slides to share with you. But yes, please, Shane, continue this uh, your response to this one. Thank you. I mean, I think there's just a question around, you know, could you and should you? Uh, and so... Um, Christina talking about conversations with customers, you, you you engage with them and they come up with some brilliant ideas. And one was, um, you know, if you've got a student who's built up four years worth of reflections and various other artifacts and assets in their store, could you use AI 
to look through all of that, you know, pass all of the text, if you like, and pull out themes and threads and skills and map them. And of course you could, it'd be a, it's a fantastic job for AI, but should you? Because you lose so much learning potential there by the student doing it themselves. It will take them much longer and be much harder but actually that's our job. We're trying to set up activities and events that make students make sense of their own learning. So for me, that's the thing we keep on kind of coming up against is what AI can do and what we should actually use it for. Because sometimes learning is hard, but it's blooming rewarding as a result of that. Ellery, would you like to take a shot at this? No pressure. Uh uh, I think for what I see uh, with students constantly is they're enjoying using the capabilities of AI. Um, they are enjoying the evolution of it. And I think as uh, a platform that our main resource is the user, uh, whatever the need is that their growth is, I mean, just in the sense of the fact that we're a website building company, we also have a whole section for portfolios because of the use that we saw from the user. And so we wanted to make sure that we had templates for them. We wanted to make sure we use templates for the educators who are giving these lessons within the classroom. So we learn and we evolve really based on what the need is. Um, and we do it proactively. Uh, I think AI is just something that's coming to the forefront and is now in the mouth and is common knowledge. Again, it's something that we had since 2016. Um, many other industries were using it before. Now it's just hitting higher education like a tsunami, honestly. Um, going into the conference and coming back from it, people don't know what to do with it. People don't understand it. People are fearful of it. And so for, for me and, and my organization, I think it's something that we're helping ease that. We have workshops that do that. Uh, there are students right now that are coming up through uh, high school and middle school and even elementary, my little kids. AI is now a norm and it's not gonna go away anytime soon. And so being able to have the settings um, and I guess the I want to say the rules set forth for it is going to be really important in how it gets to be used. Uh, I think right now it's we're in the wild, wild west, honestly, when it comes to AI and how it's being used. Uh, but I think if we are ahead of it and we're able to have our students understand and even our educators, our, our staff, our faculty, everyone understand its capabilities, um, in a positive way and a negative way, it's it's going to help out at the end of the day. Perfect. Thank you, uh, everybody, for taking a shot at this one. I think it's exciting to hear um, what's happening, has been happening, and what may come next. Um, and at this point, I'd like to turn it to our audience, who uh, many have stayed, you know. So if you all have questions, please don't be shy or comments. Um, we hope to have a small conversation with you before closing out this session with a few upcoming events. So uh, I know I had a question for you that was not in my slides, but each of you said, um, as we determine what the users need, but how do you determine that when it comes to AI? How are you, how are you guys figuring that out? Having conversations. Be doing events like this, um, having direct conversations, being at conferences, um, having chats, being aware of the projects and uh, research that is happening, and then involving people in those conversations, as well as um, having prototypes, I think, is also very helpful, because we can talk about things all day long, but sometimes we really just need to do some things hands-on and give it a go in order to see, is that something that we'd like to pursue further or not? And oh, same here. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, Jeff. I, I, I was just thinking about Ellery's answer, and I think she's absolutely right. Um, um, but it seems to me context is super important. So if you're building portfolios, which in, in effect are personalized websites, then there are so many ways in which AI could, could help with that. 
But if you've got a very general system that's used across the university, and if sometimes it's used for undergraduate research and sometimes for projects and sometimes for lab experiments, but sometimes for nurses and paramedics and all of then you you have to be really careful about you know the tool has to be able to be safe and I keep on saying safe but it's re it's really important to me um, so I, I think um, probably the place where in our own platform I mean you know back to that previous question there's loads of opportunity for for helping educators and uh, instructors to create reflective templates that they distribute to others and to create lovely designs and just to think about learning learning plans. Um, but you've got to make sure you build it into a place where, it, because you can't be there holding someone's hand and guiding them through some things that they may not have thought about. We have the benefit, Christine is the same and, and, and Jeff, that we spend so much time with different educators in different contexts that we ourselves have, you know, uh, insights. That sounds very arrogant and I don't mean it to, but we see multiple perspectives and we actually ourselves are the kind of, Gatekeeper stewards. Um, I don't know. They, they. Um, I suppose we apply. A, maybe in my case, I'm being over cautious. But I, I go back to the point you made, Christina, that once you deploy it across the platform, you can't pull it back. Once it does something wrong, it's really hard to apologise and get confidence back in the system. And I think, you know, uh, Ellery, you talked about the wild, wild west, and it is, it is the wild west at the moment, isn't it? Uh, there's still so much kind of uncertainty and uh, lack of, um, oh, I don't know, confidence just because of all the crazy things that keep on happening week after week. Um, so I, I think it, it, there is a real onus on us to do the right thing at the right time, even though that might make me in particular sound like an absolute Luddite for which I apologize. Thank you. We had a raised hand and a question. Yes, hi, Christina. So I, I was um, inspired. I, I didn't attend the webinar, but I'm in the middle of watching it where you first introduced Riff. And so I um, requested access. I have, it's end of semester, so I haven't had a chance to play with it yet. But um, one of the things that I know you and Shane have both been talking about is um, student privacy and kind of where all that information is going. Um, how is that handled with RIF? Good question, uh, Jillian. Thank you so much for that. Um, as far as I know from Leticia, um, it is hooked up with um, OpenAI's ChatGPT, but the data doesn't go back to the the system. It stays within the RIF environment. And um, I haven't checked the, the privacy statement in terms and conditions of late, but when I talked to Leticia last, she did say that it is a constant conversation that she also has with Stanford University privacy officers in order to make sure that student data is safe and that it doesn't go anywhere. But that is exactly um, one of those questions that needs to be clearly then also stated in any platform that is incorporating it or that is using it. Um, and not just for those countries where the GDPR um, takes effect, but that should be something that is being done for everybody so that it is transparent. Who can actually look at the data? Is it just your teacher? Is it somebody else? How is the summary written that you can request at the end? Um, just anything, is anything being used for training? And I definitely know in regards to training, Leticia says, no, it is not used to train any AI. So she has put the uh, a stop gap in between. But it is yeah. still something that needs to be explored further and when used with students in production to, to really be made transparent. So I can yeah. answer some of that too, even though I'm, I, I mean, I, I don't know what RIF specifically does, but we've gone through our own process of developing something similar enough that I feel like, you know, it's going to be similar. Um, OpenAI is also what we are using. Um, and OpenAI's um, default position on anyone going through the API is that they do not use your data for training purposes. So your data that your student um, put in there, this is different, completely different from OpenAI 
powering the free chat GPT 3.5. I believe that that they are totally, you know, have the rights to use everything. Uh, but if you are using through OpenAI API, which are for developers like ours to, um, to, um, to use, um, it's, um, they are not allowed to use that data for training purposes. However, this is really where these subtleties happen. And I, I think that people don't even know to ask these questions. The fact that they don't use it for training data doesn't mean they don't have the data. They, in fact, have to have the data in order to work with it at all. There's no way that uh, OpenAI does not receive the data. They do have the data. They have their own policies on whether and how long they store the data and whether or not they are allowed to you know, look at the data. They just said that they're not allowed to train um, their, their model with your, with your data. And so I just wanted to say that, but at this, by the same token, the same thing actually happens in Nuance for Amazon Web Services. Can they look at your data today? If any of you using any platforms, including Digication and possibly even you know, other platforms, look, your ISPs can get to them as well. So there is a lot about this policy in place, whether there's a, a chain of trust that you can in fact trust it. And that's what a lot of university security officers, et cetera, are in fact dealing with. Uh, but I wanted to sort of lay that out so that you know that, yes, a lot of models do use your data for training, but in the case of some of these models, in some of the use cases, we have the ability to say no to it. Thanks so much, both of you. Especially Jeff for that clarification. That was a wonderful question and a response as everyone. Uh, any final question before we move on to our final two slides, which I've shown you guys at least three separate times, thanks to having the world's most sensitive mouse. All right, we appreciate those of you who have stayed in. Um, and we do have some upcoming events. Uh, Christina, would you like to talk about these? Sure, just very briefly, I've put all the links into the chat again. Our next webinar will not be on AI. Um, it will be about two recent books published um, by our fabulous Kevin Kelly, who's also a board member of ABLE, and a second book um, edited by him and Kitty Linder on flexibility in classrooms. So very worthwhile coming along and not just because you can win one of those two books, um, but because I'm sure it's going to be a wonderful conversation also linking all that flexibility back to portfolios. At the end of May, we'll have the ISO project from Germany as guest in a webinar to dig deeper um, what their project goals are, what they have already been doing in exploring using AI for feedback and also assessment purposes. Then a month later, not yet with a link because the team is still crafting the abstract. We will have the we will have some authors of the special issue on portfolios from across the disciplines as guests, so that they can tell us a little bit about what they have been up to, what um, they were writing about. And then in August, also without a link just yet, because the call for papers hasn't been issued, there will be the able annual meeting, and it will be happening in person in Providence in Rhode Island from the 14th to the 16th of August. And when the call for papers is out, um, I'm sure that the organizing committee will also state if there's an online component either at the event or after the event. Last but not least, coming down to my hemisphere, there will be the annual ePortfolio Forum this year, a month earlier than usual in September at the University of Southern Queensland. And the call for papers and proposals has been released last year. And typically that is a hybrid event. So in-person and also online participation is possible. So I invite you to all of these, come along to them. And if you'd like to talk about something you have very much interested in, please do get in touch with us as well, because we'd be happy to organize a webinar with you so that you can share um, your portfolio expertise. Thank you. Ooh, it's busy, but uh, I hope everyone will take an opportunity to read those books. In fact, buy those books, come to the sessions, all of that. And um, Jeff was kind enough to put Eddie Watson's 
Facebook in the chat as well. And we just want to thank you, everybody. First, I want to thank our panelists. So if everyone will give them a round of applause, a one up, or whatever you do virtually, like thank you so much for your time and for this important conversation. Uh, I am sure you will have us asking again in a year or two uh, when we're all turned into holograms um, or we're just injecting portfolios into our bodies or something at some point. Um, I appreciate you. Congratulations, uh, everybody on books, emerging tech, getting through this port, uh, this this webinar, and uh, you can see our contact information here. And we thank everybody in the audience for being here today. Um, and hope that you will join us at these future events. I promise I'll tell less weird jokes in the future. That's a promise I won't keep, but I'll say it today. Uh, so I appreciate you all. Um, and thanks so much. We, we, we did record this, so the recording is out there. Thank you, guys.